Hey there, and welcome back to the extra study. This is element four. If these videos have been useful to you, please like each video that you watch that helps you, and consider subscribing to my channel to show support. I very much appreciate it. So let's go ahead and get started. Where is transequatorial propagation, or TEP, most likely to occur? The answer is between points separated by 2,000 to 3,000 miles over a path perpendicular to the geomagnetic equator. So transequatorial propagation has a really tough answer. Between two points separated by 2 to 3,000 miles over a path perpendicular to the geomagnetic equator. Alrighty, so what is the approximate maximum range for signals using transequatorial propagation? And that is 5,000 miles. So we have a TEP or transequatorial propagation picture right here. The geomagnetic equator is right in between all of that geomagnetic ge uh, genius, and uh, you can see the uh, Ioniza ionization enhancements right there where the transmitter and the receiver just happen to hit that angle right and they make a pretty good distance contact. Now that really tripped me up there. At what time of day is transequatorial propagation most likely to occur? And that's going to be afternoon or early evening. These particular sections of the atmosphere are more active in once the sun has had a chance to bombard them. So that's why you're going to find those later in the afternoon or early evening. And here's some physics for you. What are extraordinary and ordinary waves? They are independently propagating ellipses polarized waves created in the ionosphere. Now light waves normally follow the rules but some of them do not and I have no way of showing this to you but if you look up how light waves refract in water you'll see the ordinary wave takes a nice nosedive as it slows down, but then you may see a faint line that follows directly through the water, and that is the extraordinary wave. See, all of them should slow down when they go through that water, but there's some of those waves that do not follow that same rule. It's just a percentage of the total. Which of the following paths is most likely to support long distance propagation on 160 meters? Well, one, you need a LUF or lowest usable frequency that is below the frequency of 160 meters. But the answer is a path entirely in darkness. So if we go to the next image that I have here, you can see you have the E region, the F region, and the D region. Most of your low frequency signals are going to be sucked up and absorbed by the D region. They're never going to be reflected back. Uh, never is probably an under, uh, overstatement, but the majority of them are going to get absorbed. So long distance low frequency is not going to happen during the day, but if you look at night, the D region disappears, leaving the E region and just the top portion or uh, the combination of F1 and F2 is left. So at night, in total darkness, you can get that, that magic to happen on those lower frequencies. On which of the following amateur bands is long path propagation most frequent? And that is 40 and 20 meters. 40 and 20 meters. What does the what effect does lowering a signal's transmitted elevation angle have on ionospheric HF skip propagation? 
the distance covered by each hop increases. So we go back to, it's basically the same drawing I just had, uh, but I added a little extra. And you can see that these angles, the, go play you some pool and, and hit you a ball off of the side of the wall at different angles and see what the result is. That's the basic thing happening here is if you can get a reflection at a larger angle, then you get more distance covered. Whereas the tiny little angle is not going to cover a lot of distance. So that tiny angle, that is where some amateur radio operators, they take advantage of it to get that short skip. So they can have NVIS which is a near vertical incident sky wave. So it's nearly vertical and it rains right back down on them. How does maximum range of ground wave propagation change when the signal frequency is increased? So as the signal frequency goes up, the ability to propagate as ground wave falls. So that's why some of the lower bands, like 40 meters, is still good during the day. And I'm thinking in terms of like parks on the air. If you're chasing parks on the air and you live very local to a park, if they jump up to 20 meters, 17 meters, 12, that signal is not going to propagate so well as a ground wave. And it's just going to be pew, passed off to the sky and skip right over you. At what time of year is sporadic E propagation most likely to occur? Now you want to remember sporadic E can be caused by the sun in that E layer. So it's around the solstices, especially the summer solstice when that sun is way up there. What is the effect of chordal hop propagation? And we're going to go back to that picture in just a minute. The signal experiences less loss compared to multi-hop propagation, which uses Earth as the reflector. So you're going to have to use your imagination just a little bit, but imagine that dark lot the on on the night side. Imagine that you start there down at the bottom in South America, and you bounce that signal off of the E region, and it reflects back. Imagine another reflection the same way that covers twice the distance. So what if it bounces back off Earth and then reflects again off that E region? You get twice the distance. But what you're also going to get when that happens is your signal is going to be reduced by that hop. So the Earth is going to absorb a little bit. The E region or F region, whichever one you happen to be using, might absorb a little bit or scatter some of it as it bounces back off. So you're going to have some signal degradation when it uh, reflects off of the Earth. So to reiterate, question 10 says, chordal hop, that's a chord, just a chord across. Pew! The signal experiences less loss compared to multi-hop propagation. At what time of day is sporadic E propagation most likely to occur? Well, surprise, surprise, that's when the sun is up, between sunrise and sunset. And here we go. Here's that chordal hop propagation. I should have just drawn a picture of it. Successive ionospheric refractions without an in intermediate reflection from the ground. So... You can get multiple refractions, especially if you get that angle right. You might be able to shoot it off of that uh, ionosphere or that ionospheric region more than once. And then it's not hopping off the Earth. So that chordal hop propagation is, is where the big signals come in. What type of polarization is supported by ground wave propagation? Ground wave propagation is best off of a vertical and received by a vertical. So vertical antennas are much more prone to having that good ground wave propagation. And that's the end of this section.
And the next couple of sections are going to be just as complicated. This is stuff that you really just, I've given you some visuals to hopefully help you understand why it is what it is. But this is a lot of physics, a lot of just natural science. And I hope this has been helpful. Thank you so much. We'll catch you on the next one, 73 from W1RCP.